Welcome to Brave. Be inspired by the best leaders of Southeast Asia tech. Build the future, learn from our past, and stay human in between. I'm Jeremy Ao, a VC, founder, and father. Join us for transcripts, analysis, and community at www.jeremyao.com. Hey, June, good to have you on the show. Um, hi, very nice for, to have me here. I'm really thankful. Yeah, I'm uh, really excited because, you know, you're going to be uh, sharing about not just your personal journey as a founder, uh, but also someone who's spearheading DeFi, uh, decentralized finance uh, in Southeast Asia. So really excited to uh, share a little bit about that journey. Yeah, I think uh, today what I hope to do is to share with people what is DeFi, how you can learn about it, and uh, why is it relevant to the modern ecosystem in startups. Yeah, so June, you know, obviously, you know, you start out in university and what I can tell is that for a long time, even undergrad at King's College uh, London, you already started being passionate about blockchain. So how did you get started? Yeah, I think the, I think like everyone who tried to get into an industry, the first part was uh, before I got into the industry, actually, I didn't know what I wanted to do in my life as a very typical university student. And uh, how I discovered the industry was actually going to as many different industry conferences as I could. And uh, what I got in, when I got into crypto or blockchain was uh, I actually attended this um, conference and there was a very peculiar site whereby I saw people who are like what we would call hippies, right? They were dressed in a weird way and you see them hanging out with people in suits. So you have this very eclectic mix of people discussing about innovation and uh, I wanted to be part of that. So to get involved, what I did was to bring a community around in London uh, through my school called King's College London Blockchain Society. And through that, by interacting in the community, I landed my first job at Consensus, which is an Ethereum venture studio. So our founder, Joseph Lubin, he was the co-founder of Ethereum. And what uh, Consensus did was to really build out a lot of the common tools that we see in um, the blockchain Ethereum space, such as uh, Truffle and MetaMask, Infura, you know, very key infrastructure projects that um, developers love and use. So, so where I continued in consensus was um, doing enterprise sales and supporting my principal, Vanessa Grelly, to, to really talk to corporates and what their needs are and like how they interpret blockchain and crypto. But um, I left it last year in April to start my own business um, because I, thought, I felt that um, the ethos of uh, crypto was really about public decentralization and uh, enterprise uh, interactions at the beginning were not the most helpful. You know, really need to think about how you bring the community together to innovate. So I left and I started a company called Big Mochi. To me, um, this company was more like a user testing phase where I was trying to understand the needs of how people move money, in particular migrant workers, because actually they are a huge market that um, have very low access to financial services. Like them, uh, they typically pay very much much higher rates for remittance compared to me and you who can use digital payments gateways. So I was trying to understand their pain points and uh, I developed this entire e-commerce site just to understand how they interact with wallets, actually, how they interact with e-wallets, where are their pain points, where's the onboarding, how do we scale their interaction and adoption and what they need. So um, from there, my team actually uh, pivoted and we launched our protocol called HaloDAO and HaloDAO is a decentralized infrastructure uh, where we are building something called an automated market maker and lending market optimized for stable coins. It is quite a mouthful, so um, maybe I'll elaborate a little bit on that. So an automated market maker is basically, you know, you have two assets, like for example, Singapore dollar against like ETH or something like that. And people want to trade between both sides. So going from Singapore dollar to Ether or Ether to Singapore dollar. So this, what this um, technology does is that it matches their order so they can convert between different assets in a nutshell. A lending market is uh, similar to how a bank works in, in concept. So it takes in liquidity, like deposits, so to say, and it lends it out to people. Um, and all this is done in an algorithmic way. So there's very little or almost none, I would say we have none or no human intervention in assembling these value chains or interactions. And that is what makes the technology super exciting and as an infrastructure piece for others to build on. So that's what we are doing now. And uh, 
On 24th of June, we'll be launching our version 0, where we add support like the XSGD by XFIRST. Um, and we also support like uh, the THKD from Hong Kong and the Binance IDR from Indonesia. So that's where we are now. Wow, that's a great progress that you've made so far since we started hanging out. So, you know, I think obviously, you know, the part that you shared was like, you also want to help explain at a zoomed out level what DeFi is, right? And that's something that people are still getting the heads around, right? Because they start out saying like, okay, I understand Bitcoin because it's supposedly um, something that we're mining uh, and we're assigning a store of value, right? So it's a currency, just like uh, trading in currencies or stocks. So I think that's how most people are. I'll say even the mass consumer kind of understands that at a very high level, like, you know, Bitcoin is a price and Bitcoin yeah. goes up and goes down, right? So they see that on the news and they want to get in and they don't want to get out. So I think that there's a basic now understanding of what Bitcoin is, which is unimaginable, like, you know, five years ago, right? And obviously, you know, there's blockchain, which we've always been, you know, people have been much more passionate about. And then there's DeFi, right? So could you help me ex you know, explain how we get from Bitcoin to blockchain and then to DeFi? Sure. I think the common challenge in understanding the blockchain space is that people understand it from a very technical point of view, whereby the common explanations tend to focus on like, uh, what is a consensus mechanism? Oh, you secure the network with a block and block and... And that is where people get lost. So we would say that, um, you know, how I typically explain blockchain is that, you know, blockchain is the internet of value. So right now, like for example, we're on this podcast or when we interact with Google, we're on the internet of information. So it's collecting information and information is being transacted. So what's happening on the blockchain side is that we are transacting value. So what that means is uh, we are programming value to move between people and recording that interaction. So that is like a very high level what is blockchain. So what that means is many use cases that were explored before, like for example, uh, for IoT or supply chains, these have not been as successful because you're not really transacting something of value, so to say. Um, and how you transact this value is you need somewhere to store it. So the token is sort of like this vehicle to store value. So when you talk about supply chain and IoT, these tend to not be as helpful in the blockchain space because it is a uh, secured by a public network. These will probably be more helpful in like the internet of information, which like, for example, Amazon is doing very fantastic, right? When you track your packages and things like that. So, so that's why like when we look at blockchain, the important thing is about looking at use cases that transact value. So we go on to the next phase is um, if you want to build something on blockchain, how do you do it? So this is how we interpret like Ethereum and Polygon or Binance Smart Chain. So when you look at these, these things are more like, um, think of it as like an operating system. To build things on. So like um, Apple and Windows are operating systems. So Ethereum, Matic, Polygon is also an operating system. And protocol teams like myself built on these operating systems so that we can move money or create financial services replications on the blockchain. So we program money to do certain actions so that we can remove ourselves and let it be truly decentralized. So these DeFi refers to decentralized finance is the movement, we would say, to replicate existing financial services on the blockchain to program money to do things. So that, that is what it is. So what's the, what's the problem that decentralized finance is solving, right? Because, you know, isn't finance the way it's done today good enough? <laughs> yeah, I think that's a very good question. I think that one of the big things about finance right now is, or rather when we look at how technology is being structured, whether is it money or is it information, um, is that, when you build a, a bank or you build like a traditional finance, um, financial fintech startup, right? There is always this black box. You're like a silo. And what this means is the number of people you can reach and number of people you can participate with is um, a lot slower. Like for example, you think about, I'm in the UK now, I'm, I'm currently traveling. And in the UK, we have like a bank called like Monzo or, and Starling Bank. These are like challenger banks or neo banks. For them to get deposits, they can only be constricted to the local market. And they can only use that liquidity in the local market to make markets or make products out of it. But with DeFi, the, the expansion there is that it can bring liquidity into a space from a global investor pool. And that means, likewise, it can also support people in a global manner. So this is uh, one thing that's different, right? So what this means is you can see teams like SushiSwap or Uniswap getting billions of asset under management, so to say. 
very quickly compared to like a traditional uh, fintech startup. So what might take a, a, a traditional fintech startup maybe four years or maybe five years to reach, you know, a DeFi protocol can reach that in maybe a couple of months if it has a proven use case. So that is one of the fascinating things. I think the second thing is that because you are open, so many people can participate. So you are lowering the barriers to entry for financial inclusion, so to say. Um, that's not to say that we are DeFi as a movement is ready now to really push for that narrative, but it's moving in that direction. And you know we have other challenges to solve, but as a movement, I think that's the direction it's moving towards. Yeah, I think that is like the, one of the key things uh, that DeFi has an advantage over traditional finance, so to say. But I think the last thing is on cost, right? To, to maintain a fintech team, like let's say a bank, um, you usually have a lot of staff because you have to check and recheck or reconcile transactions in a manual way. But when you are able to program money, then this being managed by the code, so to say. So you see teams that are building complex uh, uh, financial tools like an automated market maker. I, I would refer to Uniswap because they're probably one of the most uh, successful projects. You only have like 20 to 40 like developers compared to a bank which might have 10,000 staff, for example. So what this means is actually there's a tremendous cost saving and th that can be passed on to the consumer. And I think that is like how we can change the way we, we look at finance. But that is not to say that, um, I think here maybe I would clarify one of the myths, is that the DeFi space will replace banks. I think that's not going to be the case. And it will replace the traditional startups or fintech uh, unicorns that we ca have come to love and use. So I would say it's not meant to be a replacement, but I think there'll be a new interaction and we reach this new equilibrium that connects uh, traditional finance and de decentralized finance. Wow, I really love that quick summary about how you're able to you know, use DeFi to basically have global inflows and outflows, uh, lower uh, the barriers to access and to decrease the cost of transactions as well as building out uh, the fundamental uh, operations as well. There's a lot to it, obviously. And what would you say are some of the interesting applications that you've seen that DeFi is uh, innovating on? Sure. I think we had this sort of DeFi summer last year in 2020 with like the emergence of Compound Protocol. So what the Compound do was like, it was one of the interesting lending protocols. So what it did is it shows you, you can take in liquidity from a global investor base for crypto and you lend it out. So there was like a very singular um, uh, use case but from there like people realize that oh you can actually do something with the crypto you can actually create applications that work that have usage there's actually liquidity moving in and out and transactions so from there it's, it's, it looks like there is like a sustainable model so to say because when the protocol earns fees and you can distribute back to the people who support the protocol very much like how a bank gives its um, depositors um, yield for example or interest you know, then you, you start realizing that, okay, we can actually do more complex things. And I think that sort of led to the boom in DeFi, whereby many teams are building uh, um, different products to, to like build on top of these, I would say, financial primitives. Yeah, this is another loaded word, so perhaps it's a bit helpful to explain. So in DeFi, in the view of conceptualizing technology is that um, there's something called money Lego. And Money Lego is about building and leveraging other, the work of other protocols to create new applications. And the exciting part of this is when we think about Lego, right? I think using Lego is a good example. You and I might both have like five pieces of Lego, but how we build it might be different. So you could make like a stick figure and I could make like a Lego car, right? And this ability to mix and match different pieces of financial applications to create new ones is like how value and innovation moves. So this is a very exciting point. I think the second point is that the DeFi space is different from the traditional startup space in that it doesn't sleep. It, has, it is operational seven days a week because the, you cannot uh, shut down the blockchain, so to say. It's not like a stock market whereby, oh, there's a public holiday. No, there's no such thing in the crypto space. Um, so you know, innovation moves very, very fast and we see tremendous amounts of uh, investor interest. And, um, you know, and this is really struck by that time. Um, so I would say that that is like uh, one of the things that's happening now. For money to flow in and out, right? Why is that uh, an innovation that everybody so stood up? Because, you know, that feels mm. like the fundamental premise of all finance, right? You know, so, you know, why was it exciting from the eyes of an insider? 
Sure. So like there's a, this example that one of uh, my core investors use. Uh, his name's called Darius Sid from QCP Capital. So like moving money is something that you know we all would like to do to conduct commerce efficiently. But sometimes it's not as easy to do so. So an example would be, imagine this uh, Indonesian furniture seller. It is trying to settle a transaction with someone in China. So Indonesia and China both have capital controls. So it's not easy to go to a bank and say, I want to remit my rupiah to someone in China. It can take many days. But what happens is that right now using crypto, I'm not saying using DeFi, yeah? let's just say using crypto, right? Some the Indonesian furniture seller can just deposit local rupiah to purchase USD Tether, which is like an asset backed stable coin, and send it straight to the person in China and the person in China can redeem it for RMB, right? And in this unique situation, it sort of overcame the, the capital control issue um, because uh, in a sense, in this example, fiat did not leave the country. It was still onshore, right? But yet the transaction was being able to settle because of the crypto network or blockchain network using uh, USDT. So this is like one of the very exciting um, uh, reasons why open money flows is very helpful in facilitating global commerce. And we're going to see more and more of that. So who benefits from you know, more DeFi? I think consumers uh, and uh, enterprises will definitely benefit the most. So one of the things that a lending market does, for example, right? let me explain how it will benefit both enterprises for, in one use case and how it will benefit consumers in another use case. This is not necessarily DeFi, but we can say how the blockchain sort of supports that. So for enterprises, let's say you're a new startup and you raise like 5 million or something. Um, the idea is that you will not necessarily deploy your, your entire fundraise at the beginning or day one. You'll always have your treasury, right? So what you would typically do with your treasury, perhaps, is to put it in a bank to generate some yield, or you buy bonds or something to have a higher return on, on the treasury that is not deployed. So this can be typically between what, 1% to 5%, because you want to get something that is safe, right? So if you're a startup, the alternative strategy is that you can convert the fiat that you have into, for example, a USDC. And you put this into a lending protocol on Binance or, or Polygon, and you earn 10% yield. So that way you sort of stretch your runway further. So that is one of the major innovations or things that a startup could do and why crypto could be very helpful for them. Right. The second point is for consumers. We would say why global inflows and outflows is helpful because there's this new phenomena in the space in gaming, blockchain gaming. Um, an example that's very good would be Axie Infinity. Axie Infinity is a game where people um, use these axes or little creatures to fight monsters and they earn tokens. And when they redeem these tokens, you know, they can convert it into their local fiat through complicated ways, but they can redeem it for fiat. And the outcome is actually, you can play games to earn a living in a sustainable way. So these people who have actually earned approximately like $400 US per month. Put into context, right? This is the amount of money that um, this person, if they're from Philippines or Indonesia, this might be the amount of money they would make if they went to Singapore to work, for example, as a migrant worker. So to them, it's game-changing because they can play at home and earn money. So this is like two different ways the blockchain space um, has evolved to really create sustainable use cases that people can use and derive value from. So, you know, I think at the crux of it is just basically saying that if you're able to run a transaction at lower cost, right, and you're able to also, you know, spread capital around to where it's needed the most, then you're able to get higher returns, right? So that's really quite innovative. Uh, so who loses from DeFi? I think who loses from DeFi as a movement is, uh, I would say, the banks in a way. Because uh, where they lose is that because DeFi is a replication of existing financial services, there will necessarily be a space where their products might not be as competitive as a DeFi protocol. Take, for example, the yield-bearing product, right? So if startups will start depositing their cash into a DeFi protocol, then you might see outflows from banks uh, because they might withdraw this money, convert it into crypto and put it in banks. I mean, in the, in the protocol. So they might not be as competitive because keeping money in there, in the bank to earn yield, is not as high as putting it in crypto. So this is where actually my team comes in, HaloDAO, because we believe that banks have a very important role to play. So I think where they lose out on the products, you know, they can innovate. And how they have to innovate is by partnering protocols such as myself. So to give an example, I think 
moving forward, you know, there's this issue of regulatory uncertainty in DeFi. And the, I, I would say the real fear is that uh, crypto and DeFi sort of challenge the monetary sovereignty of a country, which means they sort of detach the country's ability to mint its currency and make it less of a usable uh, medium of exchange. So how we bridge that gap is that uh, is through asset-backed stablecoins. So what it means is uh, asset-backed stablecoin is uh, fiat that is custodied that generates digital fiat on the blockchain. So what we would say is that banks will become these like e-money issuers or minters who use their fiat, custody it, and mint digital money or digital fiat so that people can use it to derive yield or for to help users to actually deploy this capital into DeFi and they take a cut from the yield that the DeFi protocol would have uh, given to someone if they did it themselves. So for example, if someone were to do it themselves, they could earn 10%, but the bank does it for you. So the bank would take a cut from that. So maybe 10% of that 10%, right? So they'll take 1% and return you 9% of the yield. So I think there'll be that innovation. And when you have this intersection of traditional finance and DeFi, you know, what you'll see is that actually banks will likely be more competitive and um, you know, it'll be a lot more helpful for our users because they'll be able to access like better products and yet you don't have this um, issue of capital flight and a bank run. So you find a balance. And in this case, in the world right now, actually there is no successful uh, stablecoin project apart from the USD. So actually the crypto market is a very US dollar denominated market. So most of the flows of stablecoin are actually in USDC issued by Circle or USDT. So what is needed is the emergence of local asset-backed stablecoins such as XSGD from Xverse. Right. These will need to necessarily emerge. And uh, my protocol is building these liquidity networks for people to put their local stable coins to earn yield. So that you can deposit. So a Singaporean startup founder could get XSGD, deposit on my protocol and earn like a 10% yield, for example. I'm not promising a, a yield, but I'm just saying based on the algorithms, you could perhaps get like these yields and uh, you know receive, extend, follow the, the, the use case, so to say. So let's talk about monetary sovereignty, right? And then we'll yeah. talk into the other aspects of it. So I think that's a big fear for so many countries, right? Because fundamentally, if you are a country that has been able to denominate the, the financial system, at least you know for the US globally, right? Uh, and for so many countries domestically, right? Singapore for Singapore, China for China, uh, the ability to print money has been really in the um, preserve and authority of the state. So when you think about that, obviously there's always been a lot of regulator slash apprehension or honestly pushback, right? So we saw that with the Chinese news recently where they're very much exercising authority over what is in bounds for crypto and what's out of bounds, right? So what do you think is the trend of the relationship between governments and uh, you know DeFi? Yeah, so to, to really re-emphasize the point I made just now, I think the point is that governments will want to regulate how the currency is minted so to give an example, the USDC project is extremely successful. There are so much inflows uh, for it. And you know, when we think about China, you, you, some people might think that China is adverse to crypto. But actually, China is the first, one of the first few countries to launch like, that digital currency on the blockchain. So you know, they recognize that there's a need to move value. The blockchain is a more efficient way to sort of uh, create value networks, so to say. So as long as they custody the fiat onshore, they mint the digital version, people can move that then the threat to them being replaced is not there, right? And, you know, countries, um, when you think about money flows, right, actually it's like an equation. So you have a three-step process. So the first step on the, uh, where money originates is the bank because the bank custodies the money. And then next you have the on and off ramps. You know, these on and off ramps could be, for example, exchanges, OTC desk, where you can convert fiat to crypto, right? So this is where, like, fiat moves from the bank through these regulated ramps, and then people get crypto and then they deploy it on protocols, for example. So where regulation is likely to, or should happen is on the ramp side, like how to convert fiat to crypto and regulating this conversion. You know, that is very important. And I would say there's a need for global coordination for this issue, right? Because um, for example, my, one of my crypto wallets got hacked and we sort of know, uh, we could detect where it goes, right? Cause it's a blockchain. But the issue is that when the person goes outbound and catches up using an exchange not in Singapore, then the Singapore police has no jurisdiction, right? So 
given that there are not many of these uh, re regulated RAMs, you know, I would say, or actually countries should control the RAMs, it is necessary in the future of AML and the regulation of this space that countries coordinate and have common standards and cooperation to regulate these RAMs. And uh, they can sort of find the baddies, so to say, because you can track everything on the, on the, on the blockchain. Right. So, so I guess that is like where we sort of see the movement that to really bring the next phase of crypto expansion to let it be for everyone. You need to have asset-backed stable coins pushed up for um, the community in the country. Right. Every country will start supporting this. So you'll see X first, like these kind of models appearing in a lot of places. And the next thing is uh, governments will prevent synthetic stable coins or algorithmic stable coins from listing in their country. That's how they control that. To give you an example, that is for example, uh, that is like the Terra uh, debate in Thailand, whereby the founder of Terra Protocol said that to the central bank in Thailand that he wanted to list a Thai baht. But this digital Thai baht was not an asset-backed stable coin whereby you are depositing fiat baht into a digital baht. This Thai baht that he wanted to introduce is, an, is backed by an algorithmic asset. So it's not based on fiat. So what you're doing is X, like creating money out of thin air, which is uh, you know, challenging the money sov so monetary sovereignty of the central bank. So this was naturally prevented from circulation, right? So the, the, the government still has a lot of power in preventing this kind of challenges to replace them, so to say, and it's necessary, right? And I would say like algorithmic stable coins are probably not good for the ecosystem because, uh, they, because they are backed by a volatile asset in their creation, right? Sometimes you have a situation whereby the asset, the underlying asset is worth less than all the stable coins out there in the market. So this means that if someone were to redeem all the stable coins, you know, you have like a, a collapse of that monetary ecosystem. So I, I would say that is not as, um, you know, sustainable in the long term. So asset-backed stable coins are really the key to allow this kind of uh, innovation to grow in a healthy way. And the regulation of RAMs is the most important factor moving forward. Wow, that's uh, really interesting and a great crash course for people uh, trying to understand that. And, you know, I think there's a lot of truth there, right? Which is at the end of the day, you know, the uh, asset-backed stable coins are really the best of both worlds, right? Where they respect the monetary sovereignty of the country while at the same time allowing us to have that, you know, global, you know, inflows and outflows uh, audience-wise the lower barriers to access, as well as the you know lower cost to build and to maintain on a rolling basis, right? And all of that lowers and uh, the cost, which means that it's a high yielding product on average, right? For people, uh, people get to retain yeah. more of the value as they go through. It's, I think it's more um, like um, being able to trade better, right? And paying less money. And I think being able to trade better means that, um, or trade easier means that more people can participate in the ecosystem, right? So I would say the biggest beneficiaries are consumers, especially those who are financially excluded. So like the challenge of financial inclusion has always been like, how are we going to reach the people, right? Is it, is it going to be via a digital banking app, um, given that so many people have smartphones? I, I, I mean, that has been tried very much and there's very little like headway in certain places, right? And the reason is because like, you know, even if you gave someone a nice app with a new bank, if the underlying infrastructure has high costs, you know, this still creates barriers. So the, the whole point of the blockchain movement is how are we going to reduce these barriers by making the cost lower and lower and lower? And then how are we going to improve the UI so it's simpler and simpler and simpler for people to get involved? Right now, it's still too complicated. So there's still a long way to go. And the industry is still at its infancy. So there's many much things to do. So that's what makes it exciting to participate in this space. Yeah, that's really interesting because it also benefits not just the you know, borrowers in order to be able to access credit, but also helps lenders, right, in order to preserve some more of that value. So, you know, I'd love to ask you more, right, which is that, you know, as you see yourself building out Hello DAO and, you know, what you need to do, uh, what are you most excited to build in the next coming one year? Yeah, I think the next coming one year is where we will deploy our version one product in sometime in August. So what we are going to allow is like um, local stable coins to earn yield. So we would say like startups in Singapore, Hong Kong, the UK, Canada, to all be able to use their local stable coins to earn yield and enterprises, consumers, etc. So I think that, you know, what I hope is that we'll see a greater inflow of fiat into the digital space uh, or DeFi space via asset-backed stable coins. 
And this is a tremendously huge market, right? Because when we think about the amount of fiat in the world, um, there's currently estimated 95.7 trillion of fiat. And the current amount of money in DeFi right now, in terms of like, if you think about it like a bank, right? 200 billion locked into DeFi right now. And um, there's trillions of dollars in the fiat space. So if I'm correct, then you know, we will sort of create this new equilibrium of excess, whereby it is not just the US dollar in the crypto markets, but there is um, other local currencies emerging with liquidity and people can trade and interact with that. So that will, I would say, support the next phase of the crypto expansion. So that's what we hope to do and what I'm excited for. As you transition to become a founder, what did you feel like you had to learn, right? Because there you are, you've got you know about a few years of work experience and now you're becoming a founder. Was there any things that surprised you about becoming a founder? Yeah, I think being a founder, the fun part is that you're expected to grow very fast, right? So um, because you do not know many things, but yet you have to, to be the best founder, you need to compete against the best people. So you suddenly have to learn very fast. So like when we're fundraising, one of the comments which one of my advisors, investors said was, June, actually what you're doing in fundraising is what a person in investment banking would have had to learn over a period of three years and you're compressing that into two months and you have to keep up, right? So that is the, one of the fun parts of being a founder. And I think the second part is, I would say, being very calm, like learning how to be calm and manage anxiety. So what I mean by that is uh, as a founder, oftentimes you'll have situations where something would, for example, maybe explode on your face. Like you realize, oh, there's a big problem, you know, and the typical me in the beginning would have been very stressed over these issues. Um, and the me now having had to grow is like, okay, something has happened, not necessarily positive. How am I going to deal with that? And I'm able to do so in a much more calm way and uh, manage the anxiety of uh, myself and perhaps my team so that we can agitate towards the better result and better outcome. So, so I guess like these are two things um, that I, I have that to do as a founder, like grow very quickly. So that is very nice because I can track my own personal growth. I do that by writing my journal. And the second thing is also managing my uncertain, the sense of uncertainty and being able to live with it. So that, that has been quite good for my personal development. I'm curious, so what do you read in order to learn quickly as you just talked about? What do you read? What do you consume in order to keep up and accelerate? Yeah, I, I think actually I would say <laughs> I, I don't really read these days because I find that the, the fastest, one of the things I learned in school to accelerate is that reading is not necessarily the best way to find out about how to accelerate. The best way to accelerate is two, two ways. One is actually do the thing you want to do to learn about something. And the second way is um, to find the people who have successfully done that thing and have a conversation with them and being very interested in what they do and learning from them because you know, they're able to distill their wisdom of the entire market or entire exercise in something like an hour versus you ramming your head against the wall trying to figure out different approaches. So they will be able to explain that. So I would say I typically go to the person who has done it before to learn from them. So having these conversations is what I do as a founder. Um, and the second thing is uh, how I consume information is I would say there's, there's like this obsession with like email lists to, to read like newsletters, right? So I, I stopped that because um, newsletters tend to be periodic or uh, might not be as high frequency. Or if it's too high frequency, sometimes you have too many things to consume and then you have an information overload. So as a founder, what happens is that I actually have to reduce the amount of information I consume so that I'm better. So where I uh, get my information now is actually on like Telegram groups, which are highly curated. Uh, so that I just see what I need to see, which is important for me. Yeah. So I guess that from that kind of, I have a different way of uh, consuming information to ensure that I'm constantly on top of my industry. Could you share some of the Telegram groups that you're part of? Uh, yeah, I, I, sure. I think uh, one of the best ones that I like is uh, a group called Crypto Differ. Top seven, I would say ICO Analytics is helpful because they, they sort of break down the information for you and show you like, okay, who has fundraised, who has had a partnership, uh, who are the major players coming into crypto and what they're doing. So, so these groups are pretty helpful, so to say. Of course, there's a lot of information on like ICOs, etc. Um, and this is also another point where I like to clarify the myth. I guess in the DeFi space right now, you see like meme coins emerging like Doge coins and Shiba, Shiba Inu coins. And you know, these are things that distract from the real innovation. And it was, I think when the market crashed, like maybe a month ago or a few weeks ago, it's actually positive because you, you clean the market out of this uh, negative uh, speculation, right? So um, that's important. And the second thing is uh, 
there's a lot of ITOs happening, initial DEX offerings, right? There's a lot of people trying to rush into launching uh, protocols. And, um, you know, the market downturn so far has been positive because you wipe out these people out to make a quick buck. Um, and this is also where the difference lies, right? Compared to 2017, where there's an ICO boom. That time, everyone was building random stuff that might not work at all. Like you have people saying, oh, you have a token that can help you redeem movie tickets or something. All these things don't work. But with DeFi, what you see is there's tangible usage of these applications. So they do work. So there's a huge difference there and then. And I, I would say that the difference there and then is that now with DeFi, actually the ecosystem is much more mature and there's a lot of institutionalization in the crypto space. So I guess that will bring further stabilization as we move forward. So yeah, just to clarify those myths. And I think uh, with if someone tried to understand crypto, the best way is not actually to read the news. Actually, the best way is on Telegram. That's... You know, something that gets a lot of people worried, right? Because, um, you know, when you talk about the negative speculation, you know, at the end of the day, I think a lot of people get worried about blockchain because, and Bitcoin and everything, because it feels like there's a lot of good actors and there's also a lot of idealists and there's a lot of bad actors, right? And mm-hmm. it's hard to tell who's from who from the outside going in. Obviously, once you give it in, then everybody kind of knows who are the bad actors or what to steer away from. So yeah. how would you recommend people figure out like who to trust and what to read and uh, how to enter the space? Yeah, I think actually this, is, this might be a different view, but what I would say is actually these scams and things like that are positive for the space because it sort of warns people you shouldn't just jump into anything you see, right? And I think what people should sort of follow is like protocols that actually have usage and adoption. So like on a very introductory level, I think people can look at like Uniswap and SushiSwap because they have tangible volumes. Like Uniswap as an AMM has higher volumes than some of the tier two exchanges out there. So, you know, they are already, already replacing or overtaking like centralized exchanges in terms of volume and trading and usage, really because exchanges tend to be localized and uh, a decentralized exchange or AMM is global in nature. So it's able to scale better, right? So, so I would say that, you know, when someone's learning about DeFi, it's good to learn how it works and actually see it work right you can actually interact with these steps and if you if you can interact with them then you'll know okay this is the use case and then you can trust in that so to say rather than you like just following whatever ideal comes and then um, not seeing how it works and i think that's where the scams can happen and uh, yeah i think it's still difficult to do uh, due diligence sometimes so it's best for people who are not versed in the space to to not participate in these uh, speculative activities, so to say. You should look at use cases and like tangible um, progress. Which is really good, strong, solid advice, I think, and from a macro level, but also from an individual level, which is to be, you know, self-aware about your knowledge and also be aware about what you're getting into, right? Uh, So last question here is very much, you know, when you think about all that you've done so far, obviously you've been, both, uh, you know, kind of like rising star as an operator in blockchain, but also now a founder. Obviously, you know, times have been good, times have been bad. I'm just curious about, have there been a time when you had to overcome some adversity and had to choose to be brave? Yeah, I think uh, as a founder, I mean, right now, I'm not like a crypto millionaire because, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, movement in the crypto markets, but I'm not making a lot of money. And I think the, the point there was like, taking the leap to quit my job, which paid me well, to work with my co-founder and deploying all the resources I had, uh, so to say, to fund my team. Right? I could have invested and speculated in the market and probably make a good return. But as a founder, sometimes I think the main point of being brave is being willing to sacrifice short-term profits or short-term progress for something more long-term. And when we do that, why I would say the return is not just compounded, but it's like fantastic on both a uh, hopefully on a, on a financial level and uh, as a, on a personal level. So it's like the cookie problem, right? If you delay, you get more cookies. So I would say putting effort into my current team and, and supporting that their growth is uh, probably more rewarding, hopefully. But on a tangible level now, it is very rewarding <laughs> on a personal development because I know I've grown a lot. Awesome. Wow. Thank you so much, uh, June. I mean, I think I really appreciate uh, to wrap things up here. Uh, the three things that you kind of shared here. I think the first, of course, <laughs> the crash costs on DeFi, <laughs> uh, yeah. blockchain, and, you know, uh, stable coins for uh, the general listener here uh, that's listening in or here. And hopefully they got a good sense of how those are interlinked, obviously, and obviously they have chronological links. 
but also our very different takes about what we're trying to achieve. The second part that I really appreciate, of course, was I think the focus on articulating how uh, DeFi and your approach to it will help not only um, you know improve the global flows of capital from an inflow and outflow basis, but also lowering barriers to access and you know lowering the cost and thus increasing the yield for you know everything, right? Um, and preserving more value along the way. And I also appreciate you articulating the winners, the losers in this dynamic, but also like what you think is the way forward for, you know, asset back uh, fiat, uh, stable coin, um, that will be the future from your perspective. And lastly, you know, we didn't touch on it a little bit, but I love the energy you bring as a founder uh, and that, you know, it's definitely been rewarding from a professional development basis already. Uh, and hopefully, like you said, you know, will pay off uh, over the, the medium to long term. So uh, thank you so much, June, for coming on the Brave podcast. And um, if you like this podcast, feel free to follow and subscribe and go to jeremyow.com to also uh, join the club uh, to uh, be able to discuss this podcast episode in our internal members forum. So again, thank you, June. Thank you for listening to Brave. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share this episode with friends and colleagues. Sign up at www.jeremyow.com to discuss this episode with other community members in our forum. Stay well and stay brave.